Hello. Hello. When you ask students or adults or anybody, what do you remember from studying biology? They usually say two things, mitochondria and cells. I don't know that word mitochondria, everybody remembers. But the basis of biology, well, a lot of people seem to think is cells. So the idea of what these cells are, you've been learning about cells since seventh grade. You know that they're the basic units of life. They contain a bunch of little parts inside called organelles, which are like mini organs, and all of that works together to make life, okay? You know that the human body is made up of billions and billions of cells. In our brain alone, we have uh, a whole bunch of these nerve cells that are all connecting somehow to give us our collective consciousness and all this stuff. So we're going to talk about why, why we call these things cells, the idea of cells as a, as a theory, similar to atomic theory, gravitational theory, um, as you know, the word theory is not a, it's not a guess type of thing in science. It's something pretty well uh, substantiated through experiments and repetition of experiments and everything like that. So let's go ahead and take a look. Can you hear that? Can you hear that? Anyways, back in the day, back in the day, uh, people had this idea of spontaneous generation, probably because their experiment, they didn't understand the idea of experimental design. So it's relatively recently that uh, we've been finding out all this stuff. So we're talking about in the last like 150 years or so. In the Middle Ages, scientists thought that life could come from non-living matter. In other words, they leave garbage out and then all of a sudden they come back the next day and there would be rats and frogs and other kinds of stuff around there. And it's unattended garbage can turn into cockroaches. I had that experience. I think I've told that story where my unattended garbage turned into like hundreds of maggots hundreds of maggots. It was disgusting. Luckily, it was on my balcony, so I just never went out there ever again. That's gross. Moldy grain turns into mice. Muddy soil turns into frogs. So this idea, it was actually a, a postulate. It was put forth. They called it spontaneous generation. Um, from a textbook, a science textbook from the 17th century, it's actually a recipe for how to produce mice. Place a dirty shirt or some rags in an open pot or barrel containing a few grains of wheat or some wheat bran, and in 21 days, mice will appear. There will be adult males and females present, and they will be capable of mating and reproducing more mice. How awesome would that be? The thing is, if you repeated this experiment, you would probably be able to actually get mice. So if you trust it, and by repeating the experiment, you get the same results, then you start to really uh, think that you can actually make mice by doing this kind of process. In the end, some really clever experiments were designed there. If you actually look at them, they're not so clever. It's just leaving rotten meat and rotten meat, right? The idea of having a control and comparing it. And one piece of rotten meat was left in an open container. The other one was left closed, or at least with some kind of mesh at the top. So the smell could still come out, but nothing could get in. And guess what they found? Maggots showed up on the rotten meat that was left open, and this one didn't have any actual... Uh, maggots growing on it because flies couldn't reach it to lay their eggs. That's, that was it. Okay, So that's the idea to finally put an end to all this spontaneous generation stuff. So uh, mice can only come from other mice. And other things about the cell theory, um, the discovery using this, these basic components to put a microscope together, they found that all living things seem to be make, made up of these small compartments, small compartments that look like jail cells. Um, and I think that's how they got the name cells, basically. One of the first drawings was this, done by Robert Hooke. Okay? These are cork cells. Cork is plant material. Um, as you know, all living things are made up of cells. Plant cells, humans, even bacteria are just bacteria are just individual little cells as well. Amoeba, individual cells. So that brings us to the cell theory, which are these three things that we go by. All living things are composed of cells. The smallest organisms may consist of one cell only, like bacteria and uh, protists. We'll talk about protists in a second. Amoeba is the, the most famous example of what a protist is. The idea that cells are the smallest units of life, and if you take those parts, take those parts of a cell apart, those individual things cannot actually perform the functions of life. We're going to talk about what the functions of life are in a second. And cells only come from pre-existing cells. So this raises a bunch of t 
TOK question. So you can think about that. That may be something to write about for TOK. But the idea that existing cells can only come from cells that have existed previously by division, mitosis. And therefore, new cells cannot be constructed from non-living chemical substances. Does that raise any questions for you? Okay, think about it. All right. Uh, some weird things that are out there, though. Although these are the general rules, there are some exceptions, and you have to know what a few of them are. And the exceptions help us to think about some of the evidence for it as well, too. For example, muscle cells, muscle fibers are long fibers of cytoplasm, a long membrane. And actually, each of those muscle fibers can have many different nuclei in there. So your idea of a cell having one nucleus, uh, that's not true for every single type of uh, structure or cell, basically. Muscle fibers, skeletal muscle fibers, can contain hundreds of nuclei, each containing a DNA inside. Fungi mold when you see mold grow on an orange peel or on a layer of cheese, you look at the top and you're like, that's gross, so you actually throw it out. But what, what mold is, or fungi, what they actually do is they grow these kind of like roots. These roots are called hyphae, and the roots will grow in, and they'll basically start to suck out nutrients. Same thing happens for athlete's foot. Can I show you mine? Just kidding, I don't have athlete's foot. But athlete's foot is basically caused by a fungus, and you basically have a microorganism living on your foot growing little hyphae branches into your dead skin cells and trying to remove nutrients in order to stay alive, okay? So hyphae are just like, are kind of like the skeletal muscle fibers in that they contain many nuclei as well. Some say that an amoeba, an amoeba cell, uh, which is a type of protist, because it contains all the parts of something that makes it living, that it's not quite the same as something like a human or an animal that has all these different cells, each with a different function doing different things. If you're just one cell and you can survive and do all those little things just by moving your body around and eating and doing respiration and everything like that, some consider that to be maybe not a full cell or acellular or something like or something special that deserves its own category, therefore doesn't fit the cell theory. But most people uh, still approximate, well, not approximate, they, they take amoeba and they just say that they're just regular cells. All, the only difference is they can carry out all the functions of life, whereas me, I need all my different cells to carry out all the functions of life. So in an amoeba, the cytoplasm has to carry out all of those vital functions. Um, some of those cells can get pretty big, uh, like giant algae. Giant algae are, are basically giant, large cell structures. And not all cells are super tiny as well, too. Egg cells, an ostrich egg, is a large, singular cell. A large, singular cell as well, too. Uh, red blood cells are interesting because they don't have nuclei. They don't have DNA. So at a crime scene investigation, if you have a pool of blood there, it's not the red blood cells that you're looking for to find DNA. You're actually looking using the white blood cells that are in there. If the person has some strange disease, I learned this from some CSI episode, if they have some strange disease where they don't have white blood cells, if they didn't, they wouldn't have a proper immune system. But if for some reason, there's not enough white blood cells, then they can't collect uh, enough DNA evidence. So that's kind of scary as well, too. Okay, really quickly, here's a quick practice question. Just take a look at it. Pause the video right now, try to answer it. Boom, boom, boom. Did you get it? Okay, immediately afterwards you should be all right. Uh, muscle fiber is what we just went through right there. Viruses are not considered alive primarily because based on our definition of cells and in the cell theory, things are supposed to be made up of cells in order to be considered alive. A uh, virus is not made up of cells. It's simply a little bit of DNA or RNA, some nucleic acid, packaged in some protein. There's no mitochondria. There's no ribosomes. There's no cytoplasm. Okay, there aren't these chemical, these complex uh, metabolic reactions that are going on. So viruses can only survive by being inside another cell, being inside a cell. And they use that cell's machinery to replicate and make more babies. And that's why they're really scary. Um, these are various types of viruses. HIV, that's Ebola down there. Ebola looks like a treble clef, okay? Singing the song of death. Not cells. DNA or RNA wrapped up in protein coat. Few other living characteristics requires a host to survive. Living things can be separated into 
uh, in general five kingdoms. If you look online, you may find it, they might be listed as six, but that's just because they take bacteria and separate into two additional categories. But animals, plants, and fungi are multicellular, in other words, made up of many different types of cells. Bacteria and protists are unicellular, or single-celled organisms. Um, amoeba is the famous example of a protist. There's others, paramecium, uh, there's other kinds of things, but for now, just know a few examples of each. You can obviously name a few animals, I hope. Lion. I got stuck there. I started thinking about the Lion King right now. Plants sunflowers, dandelions, fungi, athlete's foot. I'm thinking about all the stuff that goes into my shabu shabu. Not athlete's foot. That's gross. But shiitake mushrooms, enoki mushrooms, eringi mushrooms. This is all Japanese cuisine. Uh, bacteria also, also uh, fits right there. Uh, pause the video really quick and ask yourself what it means to be alive. And I'm going to fly through these characteristics really, really fast in less than one minute. Okay, really quickly. To be alive, most people say you have to show some kind of metabolism. That's basically just complex chemical reactions that are happening. Uh, cellular respiration and photosynthesis would be two examples. Chemical reactions inside the cell that are happening. That needs to happen to be considered alive. ATP is the unit for energy. So we take glucose, break it down, we get energy, that's ATP. Sensitivity, things that are living have to be sensitive to things. Plants can start growing towards light. That's called phototropism. If I get punched in the face, I react, mm -hmm. right? I, can, I, I respond, I respond to everything. Sounds, sound, light, if any kind of sensitivity, even the smallest little tapeworms and things like that will respond to light and chemical gradients as well too. So showing sensitivity. Homeostasis, showing some kind of balance. Um, for us, it's temperature regulation, uh, blood glucose regulation, all kinds of things we have to keep under normal limits. And if you're a cold-blooded animal, well, you change your body temperature by moving. You're still regulating somehow by moving from the shade to the sun. Living things have to grow and develop. I stopped growing when I was 12 years old. And uh, that's a, a really tough thing for me to talk about, so let's not talk about that. But I used to look like this, then I look like this, then I look like this, just kidding, like this. An irreversible increase in size, that's pretty easy to understand, you can give plenty of examples. Living things reproduce, wait, but viruses reproduce, don't they? They require host cells to reproduce, but they don't have some of these other things that we talked about back here, okay? Metabolism and be, may, being made up of cells as well. But reproduction is really important either through asexual means or sexual means. Look at that. Look at this cute little yeast. Yeast baby budding off asexually. Fungal spores. Fantastic. Doggy. I'm assuming this is sexual, even though I don't see a partner there wrong picture. Nutrition, being able to feed yourself, obtaining food or some kind of means of getting energy sources, okay? Uh, glucose for most things. Some bacteria don't use glucose, they use other types of chemicals, which is really, really awesome. Look at that, that's so cute. Even this guy, this little guy, has to eat, all right? And if you saw something like this, what would you do to actually determine if it was alive? What evidence would you need to conclude that this thing is alive and you'd be going through that list of things that we just ran through. So it's called Volvox in the end. Try to look that up so you can figure it out. Okay, any questions? Should have been pretty straightforward, but can you think of things that show all of those characteristics but you would not consider to be alive? Post your questions online, please. Have a good day.